tiebreaker. Oh, there we go. Good, mo good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If if you didn't hear, it is tiebreaker Saturday morning here at the Dartmouth Curling Club in the Nova Scotia Provincial Curling Championships. Here on Bell Five TV One, your leader in local sports webcasting. I'm John Seitman here alongside Selena Thompson for this Team Breen versus Team Brothers in women's tiebreaker action. So as we get started here with this tiebreaker, a, little, a few thoughts, Selena, as we get into this match, a match truly worthy of a final, but here being played as it, the two teams with one last shot to make the playoffs. Absolutely, John. Thanks for the introduction, and uh, welcome to everyone watching here on Bell 5 TV1. It is an interesting, or it has been an interesting week, um, as a lot of spectators have commented. Probably could have gone a number of ways, and uh, that's why we end up with tiebreakers on both the men's and women's side. Uh, the women's here is a little more straightforward, but like you said, um, both these teams could easily have been in the final. Uh, Team Arsenal, actually, with their win last night uh, against uh, Colleen Pinckney, who's not in the running any longer, but... Uh, they needed the win, and they needed Kristen McDermott to lose to Jill Brothers, and that happened. So Jill was fighting for her life to make the tiebreaker, and Kristen McDermott uh, was guaranteed a spot in the, the one or the two spot uh, with the loss to Brothers. is in the two spot. Arsenault's in the final based on head-to-head uh, -head records, and then that sets up our tiebreaker situation here. So the team that wins will move on to play McDermott. Yes, definitely. It should be a great morning of play as we see it. A Jen, Jen Bryan from Team Brothers a hit and roll out here. Now we will see the first of two from Jocelyn Adams of Team Breen. A, for our viewers as well, there are is one other game here in play this morning a, as we have, again, a little bit more complicated uh, tie-breaking scenario as uh, Stuart Thompson versus Chad Stevens is playing over on sheet B. Uh, that one is a, a battle of a th three teams in a tiebreaker as uh, Thompson and Stevens along with Kendall Thompson finished up a uh, tied for the final playoff position. So they will have a uh, it, the match here where the winner will face Kendall at 2 o'clock with the winner to face Mark Dacey, the 2004 Briar champion, at 7 o'clock. The winner will face the defending champion, Jamie Murphy, in the final. As we see another stone here fr from the second 14 brothers, Sarah Murphy, hit and roll over. Pretty straightforward start here to this end. Just keeping it pretty simple. Yeah, this is more of the same um, that we've seen throughout the week. More uh, on the women's side than the men's. I think the men are uh, playing maybe a little more aggressive in the first end. And even this morning, just looking over on the sheet beside us, uh, we've already got a corner guard and a couple buried stones uh, versus this open game. But on the women's side, especially, I was watching the Breen, Team Breen's last game um, last night where they came down to the last end. They had to win. They were playing Julie McAvoy. And they blanked one and two, and then they were tied after the break, and they blanked five and or six and seven, sorry. Um, so Brothers has hammer here, but uh, for, for Breen, they're happy to put the first rock in. And Joe Brothers, I think everyone knows, plays a fairly defensive game. Um, had lots of good discussions this week with different people about styles of play and what the choices are. It's a long 10 end game that we have here of regulation play. And so these teams happy to, uh, to blank. Yeah, so a reminder to our viewers again, it is 10 ends of play here with 38 minutes of thinking time. And if we were to be tied after that, we would play one more to decide the, the winner. A, Again, as we see now, a, another hit and roll out. Again, pretty s straightforward start. Yeah, the teams don't want to roll out. Um, we see Marley there, the third shooter rolls out. It's been, we keep saying it's uh, it's straight ice. Ice is, has been wonderful all week. Um, 
fast, really nice times. It's holding up. And uh, Tracy Frau and the ice crew have been doing a great job keeping the, uh, the conditions good. Um, noticing, we keep saying it's straight, and everyone says, oh, the ice is straight. But I, I really don't think it's the ice because we're getting nice curl um, in, uh, in different spots. So I think it's a little bit of uh, maybe the rocks have something to do with it as well. But irregardless, that isn't a word. Regardless. <laughs> We'll give a grammar lesson here to the people. Don't say irregardless. <laughs> uh, they're, they, they've been dealing with uh, straight conditions, we'll call them. <laughs> yeah, we did see a, a lot of that pretty similar at the Provincial Junior Championship at, at Lakeshore, where it was relatively fast, a, but very tight a, lines a, yes. on the sheets. A, so That's again, a good it, point, John. It, it has been pretty fast. Same rocks, too, Pretty right? fast, too, because... A, a, Earlier in the week, uh, I was doing some hog to hog, a stopwatch, a watching of the rocks, and it was probably going about 15 seconds hog to hog on the draws to the button, which is extremely fast for it, what it, you would probably see in the average curling club. It most would be probably a few seconds slower. Oh, exactly. It'd be 13 and a half. 14 and a half is usually what we'll see uh, t if you're not familiar with those hog to hog times. It's just the running time between. Hogs in uh, even national events. So you're looking 14 and a half is a good, so 15 is even better for. Uh, I don't know if it gets up any faster than that. If you could even throw light enough, you basically fall out of the hack, is how we say it. So now, as we see the stone there of Team Brothers at the edge of the 12 foot, w our viewers will get their first look this morning as Teresa Breen, the very experienced skip of this. A Forest Med Mayflower Curling Club. A, she has been in the Scotty's Tournament of Hearts many times before, representing Ontario with the legendary Anne Merklinger. Yeah, four times, I think. Yes, yeah, so, yeah, four times, two times making the finals, a, and has been the, f the fourth place at the Roar of the Rings if, a, back at the early starts of the Olympic history there, as we will now see. Breen will hit and stick, roll over to the eight foot, and sit her one. And if you aren't familiar with these teams, we'll do uh, as Jill comes to throw her first rock, Jill Brothers. We'll let you know who's on the teams. We've got lead Jen Bryan, second Sarah Murphy, third Aaron Carmody, and the skip Jill Brothers. And uh, here's another experienced, both at the experienced skip, both at the junior level uh, and in women's play. She's a uh, Nova Scotia junior provincial champ twice, 01 and 04, and she actually won the juniors in 2004 with a silver medal at Worlds. Made the final there, and she's represented Nova Scotia at the Scotties three times, twice as skip and once for Heather Smith. Sweeper's working on uh, this one here. Looks pretty close there. We'll get the hit. Rolls o over and out the back. Cleans house and interesting result there now as we'll see Breen puts the, the brush down. Looks to probably just, she did change her call what has she, she had originally said. She was planning on originally drawing to, to the side to the eight foot but has changed to be more of a straight draw, it appears. Yeah, there's a few ways to look at this. Do you put the rock in a place where the other skip uh, might miss, or do you put it in a place where they have to roll the furthest to, to roll out? Because you, uh, you know that Jill Brothers is going to try and blank this end. And uh, So Team Breen, like we said, as Teresa goes to throw her last draw here in the first end, we've got Jocelyn Adams. And Amanda Simpson, Amanda's the lead on the left, Jocelyn on the right, second stone. Smarley Powers at third, and of course, you already mentioned Teresa there. So Sweeper's work, working on uh, this one. Looks good from here, as it will come in probably stopping just at near the back of the four. Oh, just rests biting the button, so sitting one going into Jill Brothers final stone here in end number one. Yeah. 
just trying to decide the ice needed to get the blank and retain the hammer. So important to retain the hammer here in the first. You don't want to ha have to take a point here. No, Jill won't be happy uh, if this sticks around. She wants to roll out. That's for sure. Retain hammer. And then it becomes a nine end game tied. So final stone here from Jill Brothers, the defending champion. Looking for the blank here in end number one. It's got to grab the line. It hasn't uh, come up to the rock yet. I think we got enough of a piece there to successfully make the blank. So we'll go into the second end. Still tied. 0-0. Zero, zero, brothers with hammer. And thank you again for joining us. If you uh, started partway through that uh, first end, you are watching the tiebreaker between Breen and Brothers here on Bell 5 TV1. I'm Selena Thompson, and John Seitman is my co-pilot this morning. Thanks for coming, John. Thanks for inviting me to be here there, Selena. John, it's, you got the late night call? <laughs> I, I got the late midnight call to come and uh, be here on the broadcast with with you and our viewers for this, And but I'm excited to be here. It playoff curling is, uh, here in Nova Scotia is it some exciting action, and uh, I'm very excited to be up here bright and early on a Saturday morning bringing this to our viewers here on Bell 5 TV 1. And we'll give you as uh, Amanda gets ready to, or as she throws her first stone in the men's tiebreaker, because I know some of you are, are watching, but you're trying to keep an eye on the men's tiebreaker. We see them, uh, we're not, they're not streamed. Uh, there are two tiebreakers, so we'll have the second one this afternoon. That'll be versus the winner versus Kendall Thompson. Uh, and that'll be, that'll be uh, streamed. Um, but Chad Stevens took two in the first. Uh, Stuart had a, I was just watching, Stuart Thompson had a double. It was a tough, like a flat double. Uh, almost made it. Rock need to curl a bit more, but left Chad sitting a single and drew for his two points. So Stevens leads to nothing. So as we see this first stone here from Jen Brine, the lead for Team Brothers, just setting up the corner guard here. Looks like it's coming pretty good weight here, just to, to rest near where Skip Jill Brothers had her broom. Teresa will now call for the center guard to protect her stone at the top of the eight. As we get started with this second end, we'll I, I give a little bit of the profile on Team Breen at as we see here, lead Amanda Simpson, a finalist and semifinalist here in Nova Scotia in the Scotties Playdowns, a, making the final back in 2015, I believe, with this Teresa Breen a, foursome, and a, in 2005 was the under-18 New Brunswick provincial champion. As we see the guard set up there from Team Breen. Yeah, I think we'll see a few more stones in play this end. Both skips going for the uh, the guards. It was Jill, actually. Normally she will hit when there is a stone in the rings. She's a little more comfortable with the fact that that one's top eight, not top four, perhaps. Trying to get something going here with the corner guard. We are seeing, I think I mentioned with the uh, the rocks and the curl here, more movement to the wings. So if you're trying to uh, to score with hammer, uh, you're a little lucky because you, you are getting that inside out movement. We see that stone's about half buried, but it was by the guard by a little bit. If it was tighter to the guard, uh, it would have finished a little better behind that guard. It's a soft weight hit here. It's a call from Jocelyn Adams. Teresa won't be too upset if she clips the guard. The only way you don't want to miss this, of course, as every curler knows, is miss everything. You get one or the other, it's okay. So Jocelyn Adams here with her first to two. Sweepers working on it. 
trying to get it by the guard. Will nudge that. Remove her own in the house house it appears it will go out and will s sit second shot that's really too bad because if they uh, had realized it was going to Teresa got them off the sweepers off as soon as she knew that was hitting the guard but uh, a little sooner and that blue shooter would have gone over the top but instead it nutted into the side of their own stone and, and now it's open they did have a nice guarded stone and uh, now Sarah Murphy can access it so as you say there, Selena, he, Sarah Murphy here with her stone to get the hit, rolls over a little bit, sits her two. Yeah, really good chance uh, here this end, just with one miss there. Hitting the top one, as I said, wouldn't be so bad, but uh, it really was unfortunate there for Jocelyn to clip the one. Um, and then Sarah made a really nice shot to get a little flop half tucked. So Team Breen, they'll hit the open one, try and move play toward the center. So as we see Jocelyn Adams here with her second, a, she has a pretty good credentials here on her profile. Uh, Sc Scotty's finalist in 2015, again with Latrice Breen, foursome, made the semifinals in this event in 2016 and 2017, trying to repeat history again uh, this year. And he has competed many times in the under 18 and under 21 junior level making playoffs and winning titles so Sarah going here for the hit on the stone at the wings of Teresa Breen yeah the brothers team happy to keep things separated uh, the yellow stones which Teresa would like is for the yellow stones to eventually creep up and up and be close enough to, to have a double as she proves me wrong by calling the roll in behind. <laughs> that always happens to me. But if uh, if Marley doesn't roll in behind and just noses, that's okay. They'll uh, they'll have a chance after Brother's next shot, likely. So now we see our first look here in the second end at Marley Powers of Team Breen, the newest addition to Team Breen, I, I believe, joining the team this year, I, replacing Tanya Hilliard, I, who was the longtime fourth for Team Breen. Powers, the former under 18 provincial champion and under 18 Optimus international champion and two time high school provincial champion in 2008 and 2009. Yeah, Marley took a little break from curling. She was back a couple years ago with her, I think it was her actual full former junior team. Um, getting back into the game and then got the call this year and said sure I get to play third on a team that you know has a playoff potential that sounds good yeah, it, it's definitely a position that every curler at the competitive level would want to be to join a team that is extremely competitive very early and will always be a strong team as we see this stone here from Aaron Carmody this the third for Team Brothers gets the hit, rolls to the side, sits 1-2. couple uh, of saying the rocks might creep up and Teresa might have a chance to double with those tiny rolls to the outside as we're just seeing um, the rocks uh, tracking a bit. Those little flops out actually mean that the two yellows are quite flat in the rings. No double for Marley, so they'll look for the roll again. Teresa calling out the sweepers on there. That one took off on them. Might squirt out, and it does. Gives a bit of an opportunity here for Joe Brothers. Got a chance to sit two here. Um, Aaron Carmody will want this one, I think, a little deeper in the rings, closer to T-line. Is that, was that the indication there, John? I missed. I believe it appears that that's where it, Joe wanted Aaron to get to. So. Yeah, the higher in the rings, of course, the better the roll ability for Team Breen will be when they hit this stone. And they are playing to the same side of the sheet. I wouldn't have been surprised if Jill tried to go on the other side. I'm not surprised that they're trying to keep this stone open and as far back as possible. 
So Sweeper's working on it, getting there to the back, biting the back eight in pretty much full 12, sitting two. And those are always tough ones, eh? You, uh, it's like the lead. You want your rock to be between the T-line and the top 12. You don't want it deep. You don't want it light. <laughs> so you have a, a limited window, and with those ones, you want it behind the tee. So Teresa, again, will hit the open one. They've basically been chasing all end uh, to, pr to prevent the two, and Dean Brothers has done a very good job of protecting the two points. Of course, that's why she blanked the first. So now we see our first look in this end of uh, Teresa Breen. As we mentioned, the very experienced skip of this Teresa Team Breen for some four-time appearances at the Scotty's Tournament of Hearts, four-time Ontario champion with Ann Merklinger. And she was fourth place in the Canadian Olympic curling trials. And this team actually had a... a exciting experience having had the opportunity to compete in the Roar of the Rings Olympic pre-trials, the Road to the Roar in Summerside this pa this year, attempting to qualify for Pyeongchang, having come just short in that event. They truly had a great experience playing at the national level. So Jill's getting ready to throw her first. Same shot as Aaron's. It definitely gives a good indication as to the confidence that they're pretty much able to execute the same result here as we see Brothers with her first of two here. Brian and Murphy working on it here. As it comes off the center line, it's going to curl. Looks a little bit hot here. And it'll just sit down. Uh, couldn't have placed that too much better. Teresa's not going to take any chances. She's okay giving up two this early, so she'll hit the open one knowing that uh, it's probably going to be two against her. So as we see the, this final stone for Teresa Breen without last rock here in end number two. Looking to hit the open stone. Kicks out of the hack. Just dusting it here. They roll out, it's okay, Jill will just have the draw. They'd like to make her hit uh, and increase the chances of uh, a miss, but it won't be shot, so Jill doesn't have to uh, have to hit it. She'll play the same draw, which so I think is a great call. So as you say, they're looking to draw to the eight foot for her deuce. Sitting shot stone right now is Jill Brothers. trying to return back to the playoffs again. She's had a, a great record the past few years in this tournament. Finalist last year, losing to Mary Matatal. I think she'd like that game back, uh, given the chance. So I wouldn't, guess I haven't said that to her directly, but. <laughs> yeah, if I, if I remember correctly, <laughs> wasn't struggled. that the one that they, they, they like took, dropped a six or something? It yeah, was they, something they really did struggle that game. And sometimes it happens, you hate for it to happen in a final, but. They'll try and get back there again. And Jill's, uh, just like Teresa, tons of experience, confidence, uh, and comfort throwing the last stones. So Sweeper's not touching this one here. Just looking for it to come down to the eight foot. Will do so to score her deuce to take a two nil lead here after two. 
Teresa Breen will have the last rock in end number three playing the Blue Stones. As we see the teams just having a little chat in between ends here just trying to come up with a little bit of strategy as we advance further in this match yeah there's always a little bit of a grace period between ends we didn't talk anything about the times or the timer yet there are 38 minutes of thinking time for each team to play their respective side of the game you see the clocks there at 33 and 32 minutes so they're pretty close together um, and that means they've only used five or six minutes each which is uh, leaving them, you don't need to, you're, you're sorry, you could actually use a little more than that per end. It's about two and a half to three minutes. And really you need about three in minutes for an end, but you'd like to give yourself closer to four or five for the last few ends. The teams try and bank up time. Sometimes a blank end will do that. Um, they get two timeouts as well in the regulation time. 90 second timeouts where the clock will stop for, uh, for a period. As we see this stone of Team Brothers come to rest at the back of the four foot. Teresa now calling for the corner guard from her lead, Amanda Simpson. We had a packed house last night for the final uh, draw of the round robin. A little quieter here this morning, as I think some people will trickle in uh, throughout the morning. You can see things are getting more full behind the windows. But we are at the Dartmouth Curling Club, and there's lots of curling left to be had with a tie two, two tiebreaker games, one on the men's, one on the women's right now, as we mentioned. And then uh, winner of the women's tiebreaker will go on to the semi at 7 tonight. Winner of this men's tiebreaker goes on to a second tiebreaker, so it's hopefully a three-game ga uh, day for one of these two teams. They'll play Kendall Thompson at 2 o'clock. That'll be streamed. And then at 7 o'clock, I believe both games will be streamed as it will be the semifinals. Yes, and the men's semi as well, yeah. Uh, and in the men's semifinal, Mark Dacey, the 2004 Briar champion, awaits the winner of tiebreaker number two. Well, the winner of this game that we have here this morning will face Kristen McDermott from the Halifax Curling Club looking to the spot in the semifinals. Winner of that game will face Marianne Arsenault, the five-time Canadian champion in the final. So this call is early from Teresa. We have mics out there you can hear. It. Amanda must have just thrown that one a uh, little tight because that'll miss miss the stone entirely. You have to be very careful. We're mentioning that stone's tracking a little bit. Um, they'll track on one side of the line, but as soon as they start to cross it, it's almost like they grab that line and really curl. You're getting a lot, and that's that movement away from center that I was talking about uh, with draws. Yeah, you do see way. a lot. You do see a lot of that movement across the center line. Going inside out. So we'll now see this stone here from Sarah Murphy looking to hit the guard of Team Breen. And it will roll over and. We'd love to roll that in, get the And spin it in. is biting in, in the house, sitting three here early. And again, I'm. I'm uh Closely watching, and John's probably going to get annoyed with yeah, me. I'm I, watching sheet B a lot here. I, I do have a I horse in that race. <laughs> I think you can be a, a kind of forgiven for that one. But there. I'll well. use it as an update because uh, I am uh, keeping an eye on things, and I want to keep the viewers updated. I know you can't see. You can just see the boys out of the, the side there. But uh, it looked like a force coming up for uh, or against uh, Team Stuart Thompson. Uh, Chad Stevens threw his last draw a little heavy, trying to bury around the center. Actually slipped back and nice, uh, nice hit behind or, or on a buried or partially buried stone for Stewart. Um, after some freezes from his team, I, I think that set up a three. 
and it was made successfully. So Team Thompson, Team Stuart Thompson leads Chad Stevens three to two after two ends. Again, winner goes on to play Kendall Thompson at two o'clock. Yeah, that could be an interesting one at two o'clock. Potentially a Thompson versus Thompson. Oh, yeah, I'm really, really excited. <laughs> yeah, 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 I think you may be almost more nervous than the players on the ice for that one. Well, our, our mothers, uh, our mothers, our mother, it's the same person. <laughs> she always says, and I think a lot of parents would agree with me, that it is harder to watch from behind the glass than it is to be out on the ice. Players might disagree because they actually are the ones who have to do it, but uh, the stress stress level is, is up there. and. And all these teams do have family watching. I saw Chad's wife and daughter downstairs. Team Breen always has uh, supporters. Same with Team Brothers. And actually all the teams out here have uh, their regular crew that comes out to watch the games. You can see them in the back there. So Jocelyn Adams looking to bail the team out a little bit here with a nice uh, soft weight tap. Trying to make a little bit of a wall. We're still early in the end. Going for the hit here, Jocelyn Adams. Yeah, they wanted to keep this on the high side, so not cross the rock. It just crossed it. The good thing is one of the yellow stones is out of the rings, and the others, uh, there's no guards, but Teresa is likely going to be facing something on her last if uh, Team Brothers is able to maintain two or three stones in the rings. So we, as we now see this first stone here from Aaron Carmody. Looking for the hit. Sweeper's not touching it so far. Yeah, this one has to move. It's not crossing the line as much. We see it go now, but shooter may roll out, and there it goes across the house. Gets the hit, rolls out. Brother's still sitting, too. Teresa now calling for Marley to freeze onto that stone at the back of the four, it appears. Yeah, she could try the uh, the straight back double. They're far apart. Chances of jamming and leaving your shooter out of the rings are high. So here's the, the call to try and get something going. Jocelyn saying it's all there. They don't want to sweep this one. Still needs to curl a little bit. As it crosses the center line, it will go. Heads... I don't know if it's all there. there. They're, uh, they're working hard just to get it to the T-line. So it fooled the sweepers a little bit. They did have to go to get it to curl as well. You can see it's, uh, let's see Jill uncover that yellow stone. She can get to the inside and stick the shooter and remove the blue. I don't think Jill will be too upset if this clips the back one either, as long as it uh, doesn't stick around. So Carmody looking for the hit. On the stone of Team Breen at the top of the forefoot. The sweeper's not touching this one either. It looks like it's kind of holding out a little bit. Needs to move just over enough. Ooh, that we'll just squeaked hit. by the top yellow. <laughs> little lucky, maybe. Good sweep call from Jill to not sweep. Sometimes that's the right answer. And that's one of those things that I've, I've always said about patient sweeping, of knowing when you need to go. It, that can be a, a challenge for some curlers at the club level and at, as you, some start competitive curling as well. We'll see Marley trying to get the same freeze here. Looks a slight bit heavy. And we'll tap over there, remains open. It's a hard position for Teresa's team. Jill's team's not missing much, and they were sitting three. You're probably not going to blank, so you go for this uh, little freeze. I saw that earlier in the week, Team Kendall Thompson. They were different situation, but they were up in points. And, uh, you know, playing a nice little draw seemed like a great idea at the time until uh, Mike Fleming's team ended up with a bunch of rocks in good positions and end up scoring six. So you have to be so careful. You know, Teresa has a hammer here, so she's going to have a shot. It's it's not going to be like Jill's hitting for four, but she is right now hitting to sit for, and you don't love to have that many of your opponent's stones facing you. 
and certainly a Jill could make it a really difficult challenge if she gets the hit in the position that she's hoping to get it. It would be to the forefoot for Teresa Breen. Jill just taking her time on this one going through her pre-shot routine. Sweeper's just dusting it early, but now not touching it. Just sweeping it to get it in here. They're looking for the nose. I would have been tempted to play a little flop, John. What do you think? Yeah, I think I would have been as well if you tried to get the flop a little bit so that it pretty much forces it to the forefoot and you'd be pretty much buried to the point where you'd be unable to hit. Yeah, That's where play, I'd be going You'd for. force Teresa into a, a tough freeze and... You know, maybe she gets a chance to score a deuce, but I think this is an easier way for her to score, too, by hitting and, and making that same flop we just talked about. So maybe a, a bit of an out here for Team Breen if Teresa can make a good hit and roll. That, that yellow stone at the top of the house, if this is made, uh, is going to make it tough for Jill to defend. So as quick as you say it up here, Breen puts the brush down and is in, in the hack looking for the the flop over to try to sit her one buried. She certainly won't be happy with a nose hit here, John, so looking for the flop. Teresa Breen on her first of two in the third end. Sweeper's working on it as you see Adamson Simpson Going to be close. Makes the flop. Is it to sit shot? And Ooh, I believe it's it, close. It's close, but it. I kind of still favor the. Based on the screen that we have here, I, it could. Actually, I don't even know who to favor because one, would, one look at it, you uh, think that blue. it's <laughs> yellow, one blue, but I'd favor blue here. You'll see a little bit more white uh, in the eight foot behind the blue which means it's further from the 12 foot aka closer to the button so jill's going to play the freeze here and again if she makes it Teresa wanted that one not to roll quite as far um it just leaves a bit more space for jill to draw but a really nice effort they were on it they didn't want to let it go to nose so it was the, the right way to to play that just had to get off the sweepers off a little earlier but still a good shot her best chance for a two after really facing yellow brother stones all end. So Jill Brothers here with her final stone without last rock here and in num number three. Sweeper's not touching this one, waiting for it to try to come down a little bit. Now it is coming down across the center line. They just need to get a piece buried and it'll prevent uh, the hit from Teresa. And I don't know if they got it all buried. Uh, it's hard to tell. We can't see <laughs> perfectly what you can see from the hack. It looks like it's, there we go. Yeah, it appears like it is open enough to, to get the hit. The question is a, how soft a weight can you throw to get the, the stone while still keep Getting it past yours at the back of the eight foot. Exactly. Try to score the, your deuce. The good thing is, I think if Teresa noses, or even if she hits this a little high, it, she'll still get her her single. So high would be on the center line side. Well, if she was playing the out turn, but I think she's playing the in turn. <laughs> Brooms in the center of the rock. You don't know what they're doing. But I, I think there's too much movement to the wings for this to be the out turn, the inside out. Uh, so I think it'll be the in. Yeah, it's one of those ones where I'm playing the outside in. It's generally been running straighter all week. So it, as you say, pro and as we see there Breen it is. It going for the in turn. This is where there was one uh, from Team Brothers. They had to be very patient, but this one is curling. Doesn't want to jam on her own. It's 
could be disaster if her shooter doesn't stick around. Hoping to hold it here. Was well, it's it enough? one yellow. Definitely for sure. one yellow. Question is, is it a second? Let the players let us know. Looks like only one for yellow, but chance for two, really. Uh, I don't know if Teresa ever got out to the broom on that. They were sweeping out of her hand. So there, there you go. That would now that that will be a that was a steal there, I believe. Oh yeah, for yeah, sure. Steal, steal, of one. steal of one for Team Brothers. So I don't think it was two, but we'll uh, we'll see when the score is posted. But Brothers will be up first, regardless. So there you go. Team Brothers takes a three-nil lead after three here in women's tiebreaker action. Here on a beautiful Saturday morning at the Dartmouth Curling Club in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. Here on Bell Five TV One, I'm John Seitman, Selena Thompson here alongside for the call of. Team Teresa Breen versus Team Jill Brothers in women's tiebreaker action. Confirmed on the board, a single point steal for Jill Brothers here. Teresa Breen will have the last rock in and number four playing the Blue Stones. If that, I'm just thinking about that shot. If that curls anymore, that's a steal of four. And that would, uh, that that would was, really open up the game. That could have been so disastrous. So good on them to get the call early. As we see this first stone from Jen Bryan, the 29-year-old curling for 22 years, 2016 provincial champ champion here in Nova Scotia and 2006 provincial junior champion in Nova Scotia, the learning center teacher in the Halifax Regional School Board, and... Interesting fact here in 2017, helicoptered into and hiked out of the Grand Canyon and plans on heading to L.A. in March. She's the one on the team. Uh, it hasn't, she and Aaron haven't been having babies, so they get to do the traveling. This team uh, has joked a lot about their <laughs> the team with the babies. Jill, uh, Jill with one. Uh, Bliss Joyce, who isn't out here now, but their fifth player, uh, just actually had her, her second. And Sarah Murphy with uh, with a baby as well. Yeah, I would jokingly uh, nickname Team Brothers the team with the world's youngest fan club. <laughs> yeah, they always have lots of fans because they just keep uh, creating them. I guess uh, <laughs> that was Jill's joke, not mine. <laughs> not not worded that way. She said, "We're gonna have fans because we uh, they don't have a choice but to watch." <laughs> I don't know which way is worse. <laughs> Forcing your kids to watch. Cur I wouldn't say it's a torture to watch curling. I love it. Oh, it's exciting to watch some curling here as we see this first correction, second stone here of Jen Brines come into the top of the 12 foot setting 1-2. So Team Breen won't be happy with giving up the steal. They're down three in this do or die situation. Tie break elimination game. So using, they're trying to use the corner guard. Uh, this is a two for one shot from Amanda, trying to make the roll behind the corner while removing the yellow. Sweeper's working on this one here. Trying to go for the hit and roll as you say. Gets the hit, rolls over to the side, still sits open. If that under curled a centimeter more or over curled a centimeter more, you either make the roll or you make the double and uh, Unfortunately for Amanda, didn't get either, but uh, they'll keep that uh, rock in play, and so the corner guard will stay for now. And another update, Team Stevens forced to a single in the third. Uh, looked like it would be a blank end after a great double peel and uh, got some action on the stones in the rings from Ian Gerling, the second from Team Stevens. Uh, and a pretty open end, but then a nice uh, draw from Stuart Thompson uh, to put one right on the edge of the rings, buried, uh, so Chad drew for a single successfully. So that's tie game to, at three. And Stuart Thompson will have the last rock in and number four over, over there. The team out of the Dartmouth Curling Club looking to keep their tournament alive and advance on to face Ken Kendall Thompson at two. As we see a hit and roll out from Team Breen. And here goes the corner guard. So we'll 
see here Sarah Murphy, the 31 year old, curling for 24 years, forensic engineer for Contrast Engineering, 2006 Provincial Junior cha Champion, and 2016 Nova Scotia Provincial Champion. Here with this Jill Brothers four as the guard removed one lonely stone of Jill Brothers sitting at the button. Teresa calling for the corner guard. Yeah, it's really on second stones, it's early to bring play into the rings. So the corner guard's a call. You just hope for a miss. Settles just into the 12 foot. So sit second shot. Now gives the opportunity for Jill Brothers to make the hit to sit two. Yeah, of course, if that stone weren't in the rings, if it were a guard, that's the reason uh, The reason it was called out was so when the peel was made, the yellow shooter would roll and you'd keep the house more clean. But here, Erin can actually keep her shooter in the rings after this hit is made. Erin Carmody here, the third four team brothers. Look at that roll, it's pretty nice. Gets the hit, gets the roll, sits one, two, Pretty much straight on here. Team Breen under pressure early here in this fourth end of play. Marley Power here looking for the hit. It's holding slightly here. Still gets the hit, rolls out on the other side. Again, that lonely stone of Team Jill Brothers at the button. Still sitting shot stone. So here's a chance to sit two again, looking for the same position. Top house, center line. Super's waiting on this one. They're waiting for the line, too. But uh, I think it might be a little heavy. Probably will come to the eight foot, maybe bite the four. The only reason that that's uh, not ideal is there will be a double for Team Breen to get out of the end. So, so there, that stone from Aaron Carmody uh, coming to rest at the top of the four foot. The few things there on Aaron, 29 years old curl for 23 years, three time PEI junior provincial champion, and in 2010 was the national silver medalist representing Prince Edward Island at the Scotty's Tournament of Hearts as four stones for Kathy O'Rourke, losing in that final to Jennifer Jones out of Manitoba, the former Olympic gold medalist. Do we still say current? Because they haven't had the Olympics yet for uh, for 2018. <laughs> Again, unfo defending, unfortunately, defending Olympic, yeah, gold defending Olympic gold medalist, unfortunately losing out in the semifinals of the Roar of the Rings. A Rachel Holman of Ontario going to defend that title for Canada in Pyeongchang. With the new addition to their team of fifth, Cheryl Bernard coming out of retirement. A, coming out of the broadcast booth and in to the, s the fifth position for Team Holman. That's not a bad pickup for a fifth player, is it? Yeah, uh, definitely taking up a lot of experience from the former Olympic silver medalist, Cheryl Bernard, having, unfortunately, she had the tough miss of a, a steal in 11 to lose the Olympic gold medal in Vancouver. So looking for a little bit of Olympic redemption with Team Holman. As we see this first stone from Jill Brothers looking for the hit. Yeah, nice the nice double. We were kind of talking over it, but the nice double made by Marley Powers there. Uh, so it keeps the end open, and the blank alive for Team Breen. We're in the fourth, so 
Uh, they're going to have to put some points on the board soon. You're down three, and uh, there's a lot of game left to play, but you'd like to score a couple, um, you know, hopefully before the break. You don't love going into the second half of a game uh, with a deficit of three. You really don't want to go with any deficit you'd love to be leading, but of course we can't all have what we want. It is definitely one of those situations that a team brothers as opponents have seen all, all week where they they have had a very strong start and going into the fifth end break generally if you're down against brothers it can be a challenge to regain that yeah they're an excellent uh defensive team they they're, they tend not to have a ton of points on the board they don't win by a lot but when they do get that lead uh they'll defend very well of course, these two teams did face off in the round and robin play with the Team Brothers defeating Team Breen 9-5. Brothers at, uh, and Breen having played four, four times this year, 3-1 to one advantage in the Series 4. Team Brothers on the World Curling Tour and in Bonspiel events based on what I saw this morning when I looked it up. There are, that's You're one of those few facts man, that I John. didn't uh, know right off the top of my head. I know your, your knowledge of uh, curling statistics is very broad, much more than I have. That's why I rely on you. <laughs> and sometimes the random facts are what, what make these broadcasts a little bit interesting. We'll see here now Jill Brothers with her final stone without last rock in end number four. Going for the hit, gets two. The, the nose rolls over a little bit, sits her one. So you'll see pretty quick there, Breen putting the brush down for Powers. Looking for the, the blank, it appears to retain the last rock. Yeah, again, much like Jill in the first, doesn't really want to score if it's only going to be a single. Look to roll this stone out of the rings and head to the third. I'm sorry. The Over to the fifth. <laughs> the fifth. I Time flies other, when you're having fun. Here. The other odd. Uh, the other odd end. All I'm thinking is we're going to go away from the board from the glass. <laughs> so there it's you go. Too early, and I'm not a morning person. Uh <laughs> so final stone we'll here for Teresa Breen w w with the hammer. Gets. Just enough there to make the hit. Rolls out to blank end number four. Breen will retain the last rock in number five, playing the Blue Stones. So heading into toward the fifth end break, almost halfway through this action here on a Saturday morning crowd starting to form up here at the Dartmouth Curling Club exciting championship action here this weekend as we determine our representatives in Penticton BC at the South Okanagan Events Center at the Skies Tournament of Hearts and in March at the Brand Center in Regina for the Tim Hortons Briar First time both events have had the full 16 team field. Yeah, absolutely. Exciting. And it's a different format uh, that's been used for other events. For example, the, the mixed nationals, the juniors. I think the seniors have gone that way too. I believe the seniors mistaken. have. And uh, of course, the uh, exciting addition to this year's event is the addition of the wildcard team, which will be the top two teams uh, in the the C CTRS rankings who did not win their provincial championships will face off in a Friday night showdown for the 16th and final spot in the Scotties and the Briar. It's like the uh, the new pre pre event uh, qualifier yeah, we've it's seen for the past few years, which was uh, basically an elimination game for two teams. With the new format, uh, more teams get to participate. You go to two pools instead of playing the full round robin against the other uh, 12 or 13 teams. It was, it was a long week, uh, so some fewer games. 
and a better chance for, uh, for those teams to make it in. So would they have, maybe you don't know this, and, and I hadn't thought to ask before, like it, say, you know, Manitoba gets a second team. Do they also wear Manitoba? Are they I, I, Manitoba they, too? I, they haven't yet to decide it as far as I know. They, they, uh, I, I believe they're not considered as a representing their province. They're considered as the wild card. Or, right. Uh, th that is yet to be officially announced. All right, I want to give them a, a rainbow jersey then. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll have to see once the... The, the wild card team steps out onto the ice at the Scotty's Tournament of Hearts. That one yeah, being that's when we'll see pretty it. soon there as that starts January 27th. Okay. So that's pretty quick turnaround for the winners here of this event. Same thing was for the juniors. It's a little earlier this year. They're getting underway today. Is she win again? Yeah, so We've we'll, got team Matthew Manuel representing on the men's side and team Caitlin Jones representing on the women's side. Um, and everything gets a little bit uh, moved around in an Olympics year, so the Scotties and the Juniors being held a little earlier than normal. And then we wait uh, until March for the Briar. That's March 3rd to 11th. And we wish Team Matthew Manuel and Team Caitlin Jones good luck as they look to uh, win a national title. Uh, of course, it's been a little while since Nova Scotia's won a junior national men's title, but again, more recently, the junior national women's title for Nova Scotia was just go with Mary Fay having won the national and world title. As we see the guard taken out, gets the hit, gets the roll. Shot stone still belonging to Jill Brothers at the top of the forefoot. So another open end here. Um, Teresa really needs in the last end. They, Team Breen, they love to score, so we'll see the corner guard. They've got a little bit of time here in this end as we are on second stones. Try and get something going. We know Jill will be playing the peel. She's been uh, hitting and hitting successfully. So we'll see the corner guard set up again from Teresa Breen and her team. And I'll give a partial update for sheet B. That's the Stevens and S. Thompson, Stuart Thompson game. Like a three might be materializing or a two uh, for, for Stuart, but I saw Chad make a nice double. And then I'm assuming uh, actually it might have ended up Made a second one or, or a roll out, ended up in a blank end. Oh, there you go. That is a blank end for the Thompson <laughs> versus Stevens. I knew it was either Stevens that scored uh, or it was a blank because Stevens was up first. And I didn't think that they scored, but uh, Colton Steele just kind of dragged the fourth end marker across, making it look like someone scored and then popped it up for the blank <laughs> on top of the scoreboard. So Stuart Thompson. Retain the last rock in end number five over in men's tiebreaker one action. Retaining the last rock in end number five for them. Sweeper is really working on this one, needing to get it across the hog line. Teresa dragged this one as far as they can. Yeah, I don't think it matters where it is as long as it's in that guard zone and... Uh course over the line is a requirement for that Jill was going to be hitting this all day she's happy to have Teresa blank every end including the 10th yeah I just want to up three brothers is as a defensive team can really make it very difficult on you to score points as we see they hit and roll out there from Aaron Still Making again, it easy for the sweepers there. No sweeping on that one. The lonely stone there of Team Brothers sitting at the top of the forefoot. Yeah, Teresa keeps calling uh, this corner guard. She's called in the same spot. I might be tempted just for, you know, trying, the sake of trying to put the corner on the other side. See if you get a miss, Aaron. Uh, Maybe threw that last hit a bit wide, and the Supers had to wait for it, so that might be why Teresa's saying, well, maybe she'll throw it wide again. I tend to just like to try and get them to throw in a different spot. 
you know, just trying to get a little bit of a change in the ice. Maybe a, a spot where they haven't gotten a bit of the, an idea as much as of yet. As we see the guard pretty much put up in an almost similar position. So that will give the opportunity for Aaron Carmody with her second of two in this fifth end to go for Sweeper's working on this one here. Gets the hit, rolls out again. So believe it or not, we are uh, on the last of third stones here. It'll be skip stones after this. So Teresa realizing that, well, if I can't score two, I would still like to blank. She'll uh, bring this one into the rings from Marley. So it appeared based on the brush movement over from Teresa that they were looking to freeze onto that stone at the top of the forefoot. And it looks pretty good from here. Yeah, freeze or at least uh, get to the nose. You can have a little tap. Jill's going to hit it. Uh, I think it was frozen. It might not be removed. She, I don't even know if she would guard that and she would still try and hit it. Yeah, it get, gets some separation still. Jill Brothers sitting one without last rock. So this should just be to uh, to pick it out, but if it overcurls a little bit, they're playing this on the side where even if you get to uh, close to nose, that you're hitting it at the angle that will ricochet off the back yellow and remove both, and the shooter will stay in the rings. And as we see this first one from Jill Brothers, I... It, Neglected to go through the profile for her. She's nice that we haven't talked about. The 34-year-old curling for 25 years, a hairstylist, and she's again very experienced, a former national champion, multi-time provincial champion. She had a fun fact for us. <laughs> yeah, she's a honing her son Casey's skills to be a future Olympian. Exactly. I think there's a few curlers in the men's and women's field here this year. The Deloitte Tankard and the Scotties Tournament of Hearts. Uh, young children who their future plans may go toward being a uh, coach for their kids if they can convince them to to play. Tends to run in the family, doesn't it? Yeah, there are a few of them uh, we have seen in uh, the provincial juniors, uh, a few of the participants in our event here. Uh, who were coaching, uh, including Paul Fleming of Team Murphy, who was coaching Team Ryan Abraham with his son, Jake. And then the other one that we've seen often behind the boards, not as the, the co coach, but as a very strong supporter, being Chad Stevens with his daughter, Taylor, uh, in a, a to be in contention for a spot at the 2019 Canada Winter Games. Yeah, Chad's daughter Taylor on the Callie Moore team. They're actually coached by another curler, Rob Moore. That's Callie's dad. Second place finishers at the Provincials. The Junior Provincials the other week. And, uh, that's being played this weekend, isn't it, in Lunenburg? Or starting this week? Uh, this weekend is the uh, Lunenburg Youth Spiel. Oh, uh, that's which what that, it is. Sorry. Uh, uh, that's an under, eight, under 18 and under event. A, a very large field of 32 teams, if I remember correctly, uh, coming from around the province for, for that event. A, a few of, of my friends from the Dartmouth Curling Club Junior Program competing in that event. We wish them well out, out in Lunenburg. Teams over there still a, a, a little while before they compete for the their respective provincial championships. Of course the under 18s again compete with a chance to go on to the national under 18 championships in the second year that they've been running that event. So now final stone from Jill Brothers without last rock. 
Looking for the hit on the stone of Team Breen at the edge of the forefoot. Gets the hit, gets the stick. Team Brothers sits 1-2. So forces it into a difficult position for Teresa. Now appears she pretty much has to make the double on her final stone here with Last Rock in end number five. Yeah, I don't even know if she needs to make the double, John. Just a nose hit. Uh, chance for the blank isn't there I, unless you play it real aggressive and try and squirt your shooter back. But I think you risk going through the hole, so I think it might just be actually. Yes, it does appear that it would be enough that it would it would s stick for the single point as long as they get the hit. hit. Final stone here from Teresa Breen. Sweeper's working on it here, trying to hold the line. This is a it's further over the line than the other end when the steal was given up, but again, an over curl. I think Teresa's just being a little narrow on these intern throws. It's hard to tell. Uh, we're, we're watching the cameras here and hard to see behind the sheet exactly what the line looks like, but Marley calling the sweep out of Teresa, and that'll be disappointing. Another steal for Team Brothers. That's one in the third, one in the fifth. We're going to go to the fifth end break here. Uh, Brothers will lead 4 nothing over Team Breen. So we'll catch you back at the Scotty's Tournament of Hearts tiebreaker in five minutes here on Bell 5 TV 1. Oh my God. 
Gentlemen, welcome back to Tiebreakers Saturday morning here at the Dartmouth Curling Club in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia. This is Tiebreaker in the women's action of the 2018 Scotty's Tournament of Hearts here on Bell 5 TV. One, John Seitman, it's Selena Thompson alongside here for the call of this Team Teresa Breen versus Team Jill Brothers. A few over curl in end number three and end number five being the difference here as Brothers holds a 4-0 lead through the of this game. Teresa Breen will have the last rock in end number six playing the Blue Stones. And I'm just uh, watching very dramatic last stone over in the uh, Sheep B, the men's tiebreaker. It was a draw for three leave for Stuart Thompson in a tie game against Chad Stevens rubbed a front rock that was uh, third or, or might have been fourth stone so uh, they're just taking a look I think it's a couple points maybe three yeah we'll keep you updated there when, once we see the result on that it yeah, appears we'll have that a measure. it appears that a, a head umpire Gordon Woodsworth heading over with the stick to measure that stone on B. So we so get we'll carry on here. here. So if you just catch here, Bell 5 TV 1, thanks for joining. You got to sleep in this morning a little bit and get the second half of the Breen Brothers tiebreaker. Blank the first Jill Brothers uh, and then scored two in the second with a really nice uh, end, keeping things pretty straightforward for the deuce. And then in three and five for Teresa Breen on her last with shots for a single uh, or actually a shot for two in the third but uh, both over curled and actually gave up a steal of one so they trail by four points here in the sixth end Amanda Simpson on her second of they need these corner guards and the come arounds that are associated with them so the first stone We'll see coming into view in a few seconds. So as we see this first stone here from Amanda Simpson of Team Breen Correction, second stone of Team of Simpson trying to get the draw behind the corner. Looks pretty good. Might be visible, but you play the safe shot and play the peel. You could uh, play the back one, and if it's tight and ticks the front, that's fine. But... Uh, up four now, don't really need to take chances on missing, so play here for Sarah Murphy. Um, and they did confirm with the measure that it was a successful three-point end. So that doubles the score for Team Stuart Thompson. They lead at the fifth end break, Chad Stevens, six to three. So that is a big three-point end for it. Looking to advance on to some the tiebreaker number two at Two o'clock against Kendall Thompson. Could be a battle of the brothers in semifinal. No, question in tiebreaker number two. There's tiebreakers galore here on a, a, a Saturday at the Curling Club. Sure are. One for the women and two for the men. 
That usually happens when you have a fairly even field with uh, different teams all beating each other. It's really funny. Uh, I, I can't. I don't know <laughs> if Kendall's watching this, but Team Kendall Thompson. They went three and zero. They were the top team, and then they then they lost. They dropped their next three and really had to stop the bleeding last night to uh, to make the tiebreaker. But by virtue of the fact they had beat the other three teams that they were uh, potentially going to be in a tiebreaker with, so the three teams they had defeated were Stuart Thompson, Mark Dacey, and Chad Stevens. Uh, they get the bye to the second tiebreaker, no matter what. Well, the bright side about uh, th these tiebreakers is that at least we don't have the situation like uh, they had at the Road to the Roar where we were they were playing tiebreakers there at 11.45 at night. Yeah, it's really funny that you say that. I, I, I was at my nationals in the, the Travelers level, the Travelers Curling Championships uh, last November. We were in a tiebreaker situation, which is so fun, not. <laughs> uh, and uh, it was a three-way tie. And we had the best draw to the button of those three teams, so uh, our team actually advanced to the to the 9 a.m. Uh, tiebreaker. And the two teams that uh, had to play off to play us had played each other uh, in the evening the night before, and then had to play at 11 o'clock that night. They didn't get off the ice until one. And with the tight schedule, and same thing happened at the Road to the Roar. Uh, I felt bad. The team that played us that next morning probably only got four hours sleep, uh, and they. Uh, suffered <laughs> a loss in our, our gain in that uh, case so it, it really can affect things actually it's in interesting that we just mentioned about the r road to the roar because it was actually Teresa Breen that was in one of those 11:45 p.m. tiebreakers uh, unfortunately and losing it to Nadine tie Scotland and yeah and that was really cool on the men's side team Jamie Murphy uh, also participated in the road to the roar Didn't make playoffs for them, but really, really good experience against those teams that uh, will undoubtedly, many of them will be at the Briar in Regina on March 3rd to 11th. And that's being played at the Brant Center in case anyone uh, knows Regina. I've never been there, but I think a Briar would be a good excuse to go. Yeah, I haven't been, been to that facility e either, but it, uh, again, Hey, Regina is very much a sporting town, so the, it, it'll be an exciting experience for the winner of this event competing at the 2018 Tim Hortons Briar. I think we'll see a few Rough Riders fans there. They rock the green all the time. So tough end uh, materializing here for Team Breen. We see a big weight uh, throw there from Marley Powers. Just a lot of uh, there's yellow stones and... There's one, there's one corner guard uh, for Team Breen. You see there just over the hog line, but it's not going to protect much. Uh, anything behind it would be available for a hit, um, unless they can get one really buried around there. There is a, they do have a, a rock in the top 12, and Teresa may elect even if this is hit from Aaron to uh, to go around that corner situation. There's not really a good place to hide for Team Breen though. So it does appear again going for the hit, keeping with their defensive style that they've been really playing well with all game. Here, here Carmody going for the hit. Murphy and Brian working on it. Gets the hit, rolls to the other side. So it's 1 2. Yeah, and that's a nice roll. Takes away that corner, actually. Sometimes teams want to keep things out. Um, but it pretty much takes away that other side. It would have been hard to come around anyway. So here we see the call for Marley Powers on her second to come around this corner situation. They'll be looking to overbury this, actually try and get behind that yellow a little bit. That blue guard is just so high. It's only about uh, under a rock over the hog line. So it's uh, too much. And this is the spot going to the wings with more curl. So even hits will curl around that guard. Adams and Simpson working on this one here, trying to get it as far as they can. Sweepers working, Breen joining really, them. Really want to get shot out of this. And, and I it, don't think it will. It does appear that it will sit second shot. It appears that Aaron was pointing to that yellow of Team Brothers, it, saying, yeah, it's ours. Ours is the, the shot stone. They did get it fully behind uh, 
the blue. So Teresa may have a play on it if there were no other yellow stones in the rings. But I think Jill's just going to sit two here. Doesn't need to mess around with that side of the sheet and chance putting Breen into a scoring position. So she'll just play, uh, play into the center here. It's tempting to, I'm seeing what Jill's saying, to put one that's a bit tucked uh, behind their own top blue stone. The risk with this is, say you go a little bit deep or you leave your stone, you don't tuck a piece. Uh, and Teresa makes a nice hit and roll behind. The game is on for the two points. Um, I have to say, I'd be tempted to, to, it's not a really great place to put this. Uh, you're, you're in a good position and you just are looking for the one place where you won't give the other team a, a chance. I might be tempted to leave this open just further back in the rings. I don't know about you, John, but that might be my tendency there. Yeah, maybe uh, I tend to agree there is simply in the fact that it, if you leave it open it, near the back, it produces a lot more uh, possibilities that Breen may end up having an error, which could cost her. And just keep it open. You know that this brother's team... They love to hit. I mean, Jill's playing a draw here because the hit is not a great option. Uh, and she is sitting the single, so uh, just make it more difficult for Breen to score. And if, of course, this, if this shot's made perfectly, then I'll eat my words. And But uh, they have to wait for the curl here a little bit. It's going now. Sweeper's working on this, trying to get it every inch that they can. Sit shot stone. So it is shot. Um... It's maybe kind of fortunate that it stops so high because I don't think there is the roll. You'd have to come off the side yellow, the higher yellow, to roll in behind, and then it's not being wouldn't be used as cover. So, in order to bring multiple points into play, Teresa's going to have to play this hit and roll. It does look slightly lined up, depending on how how you hit it. it the roll over to the other side. These rocks, when you play big weight, tend to be fairly reactive. Yeah, the narrow striking bands is the reason for that. So you get a lot more action than uh, sometimes you do with older club stones. Although for Team Breen, playing out of the Mayflower and, and Brothers as well, they play out of the Mayflower Flower Curling Club. That happens to be my club, so we did get new stones this year, and they are... Uh, they're a lot more like these ones. <laughs> We're getting some nice curl and some really nice uh, reactions. Makes it fun for club curling, that's for sure. Yeah, it's definitely always fun when you have really reactive stones. I've been, it's been maybe an unfortunate I have yet to get over to curl at the Mayflower this year, uh, but definitely good to see that some of the new stones are pretty good reactive and probably curl a lot I'm guessing with the fast ice over there too yeah the uh, <laughs> it's something I harp on a lot and I had a, I was doing a, a skills clinic the other week with a, a rental league and we we pulled some people you know that have played it was like novice over on one sheet and, and uh, more experienced curlers that want to work on skills on another sheet and I had those guys and I said well what do you guys want to work on and <laughs> one of them Second, the second one they asked for was, well, can we can we work? First was line of delivery, and the second was release. And I got really excited because I always talk about positive release and um, how you throw. And with the new stones, they really do need to have that positive release. Um, it was fun to do with a group of newer curlers because you could really see we actually counted their rotations. I made them count the rotations of their peers as the rocks went down the sheet, and they were actually seeing differences in. Oh, those people that threw, you know, when they only had the two rotations, maybe a little soft release, theirs were curling six plus feet. It was really hard to control with sweeping. Hmm. Um, but if you had that nice three and a half rotation, minimum three, don't want to get too much more than four, um, and they could see it, and it was really, uh, really neat. So that's my, my spiel on rotation. <laughs> it's been a little tough for some of these players. Um, we're seeing Teresa maybe get her interns going a little bit. It's It's been, with the way these players are, are uh, having to throw on, on conditions where they're getting a nice curl, you have to throw that, that positive release. Um, and 
it's been tracking a bit here this week. Uh, so players have been tightening up the ice. And when you do that, and when things are crossing the center line so hard, uh, you really can't be tight. Um, so you have to play it tight, but you can't throw it tight. Anyway, all that being said, what does Teresa have here? Shot for two? Is it a flat double? It is possible that there originally it looked as if she was thinking of a potential draw, but I really don't know. It looks like it is in a position that you could get a flat double. Yeah, I think it's the intern. Um, and you get a more flat roll when you play, when you come across the face of the stone. And this is a fairly flat double, but even if she doesn't get the double, she'll be able to get her single. Final stone, rocking in and number six, Teresa Breen. Sweet. Can't nose. I don't think she shot if she noses this, so needs the roll. Sweeper's not touching it there till the end, and it does appear to be most likely another steal of one for Jill. We'll wait for the confirmation from the teams, and uh, perhaps we won't see the score posted, but whoever is uh, throwing first, it will be a single point. So Amanda's getting ready to throw. Maybe the camera deceives us a little bit here. We'll call it one for Breen. So it, it does appear that know. it was... <laughs> Yeah, I don't know either. It seems both teams they looked at like their getting set to go, and then oh, oh, it does. Brothers. Team brothers are getting into the hack. So a steal of one in end number six for a five-nil lead. Teresa Breen will retain the last rock again in end number seven, playing the blue stones. And as we always say with curling, that being that it's a game of inches, sometimes the little tiny bits of over curl and under curl and a, maybe a little bit of extra movement on a rock can make a difference. And that has been what has gotten Jill Brothers so far to this 5 nil lead playing the seven bend. So, and looking to advance on to that semi against Kristen McDermott tonight. And it is so hard. We mentioned earlier this brothers team ability to defend. I don't think they've really missed any of those shots. They've been making pretty much everything. And uh, they can all throw nice weight and accurate hits. Uh, and that makes a big difference when you're defending a lead. And, and you do, you know, if the other skip is missing the shots for one, it's not for lack of trying with uh, Teresa there. That's Turned didn't curl, so you know five nothing. You uh, you got four ends to to do something here for Team Breen. So Amanda Simpson here look, looking to set up the corner guard. So the free guard zones in play, we haven't talked about that yet. Most curlers uh, would be familiar. But if you aren't familiar with curling, you are joining us on Bell 5 TV 1. This is the Scotties Tournament of Hearts, the Women's Provincial Curling Championships for 2018. Team Jill Brothers leads 5-0. The free guard zone, if uh, the first four, within the first four stones, you cannot remove your opponent's guard. So that's anything in front of the rings in that white area. You can't remove your opponent's stones until after that fourth rock has been delivered. So here is that fourth stone after this. Brothers will be able to hit. They did throw their second lead stone through the rings, so they're really on the defense at this point in the game. And, of course, one of those changes uh, coming next year will be the uh, addition of the five rock free guard zone. From is that coming uh, in uh, as for As far as events? I've heard, it's uh, coming in with the World Curling Federation coming in next year. So wow. I, I would assume that the CCA would probably adopt that for for national level play starting next year. So you can see you can see why Team Breen might want that rule uh, now. So the the five rock rule protects 
the ability of the team that's down and has hammer a little bit more. So with when you when you've scored last, you technically get those two guards, the one and three rocks, uh, to play. But say you're still down and you have hammer, um, that fourth guard can be peeled immediately after it's it comes to rest. So the five rock rule actually helps uh, teams in that situation down with hammer. And that'll be one of those neat things to see as it advances into play. They've, they've been using it the past few years with the Grand Slam of curling. Now it certainly going makes to things new a little more interesting. Oh, we're getting a little bit of talk here at the club. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me a bit of mixed doubles with uh, people talking about different formats where maybe uh, a, a rule being introduced eventually where no rocks can be removed. That would be a bold play. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I see the five that rock as much. Rule five, comes first. Uh, five rock rule has been uh, really s strong in the past few years with the Grand Slam. It just forces a bit more offense for the, the teams. Give me a little bit more ability for the, the team who's down, as you said, to have the extra guard. Yeah, it reminds that that kind of rule reminds me so much of mixed doubles, where you know there's there's different. All the rules are different in mixed doubles. You throw fewer rocks. Of course, there's only the two players. One throws three. One throws two. You can't remove anything from play and after five rocks. And if you blank, hammer switches anyway. So there's no benefit in uh, blanking. So those are all some different rules that are we're seeing. And of course, we're going to see the mixed doubles debut at the Olympics in Pyeongchang in February. I wish I knew the dates, but I the curling spans the entire event. So it really doesn't matter if you turn on the TV. Curling. Uh, uh, well, the mixed doubles event will actually be the uh, starting the day, as far as I remember, before the Olympics begins. Oh, wow. Uh, as uh, that will open up the Olympic curling a event a with for that event it will be John Morris and Canada representing Canada at the Olympic Games in mixed doubles play. Yeah, that was a hotly contested national championships there at the mixed doubles. I think it uh, turned a lot of people on to the format, and you'll see more people playing if the uh, the traditional four person team and I. But the more I, I like the idea of the mixed doubles, too. I haven't played uh, more than a couple ends myself of it, but um, really is a good opportunity to, to have a truly uh, men's and women's uh, equal playing ground sport where um, both genders can compete together. So I think that's a really nice aspect of it, too. Powers here uh, coming around. The team Brothers have been very successful in peeling one of the two corner guards every time, so... Uh, Marley's going to bring this one in, but Teresa will help. Sweepers have worked very hard this game. Yeah, they really need this in here. Just coming up onto the D in Deloitte on the corner. So that does give the opportunity for Jill Brothers to call for her third Aaron Carmody to hit that stone just thrown by Teresa Breen's team here. Appears to be pretty close there. Gets the hit. Rolls out the other side. So Marley will have a second chance to go around the guard. There was no double peel, just a single. So the guard's still in play. So Marley here with with her second stone, I, be, I believe there, and it will be trying to get her guard. Waiting for it to curl here, just enough to get behind the guard. So Jocelyn making sure they don't care how deep this is in the rings as long as it's buried. Jill will hit the guard. She appears to be pretty much greedy, completely buried. 
If she can see the back one, she'll probably go for it. That's why Jocelyn was trying to get that stone buried. Ah, so she is going to go for it. You play this tight, though. You tick the guard, and that's fine. But this is a downweight call. She likes more of a board or control. I suspect board. I think that's maybe still a little too much for control weight. And that's one of the, the, the types of hits that he, Jill has played extremely well with all week. So now we'll see this first of two from Jill Brothers without Last Rock here in end number seven. How does this one look? Sweepers are not touching it. Needs it to curl. And just goes by pretty much one of the first miss we've seen from this Jill Brothers team in a while. Yeah, and maybe just got a little too excited through the extra weight and it didn't curl. You do have to play those ones tight because getting the guard is okay. Um, if you hit the guard, Teresa's going to hit the uh, open one, sit two, you'll have uh, an open hit, go go for the double, uh, but give up two max. Missing everything, Teresa can come around, and uh, she won't sit shot, but she'll have two behind the guard, and Jill will have to make a decision. Does she uh, try and freeze in or, or make a hit if she can see anything? or guard her own shot stone, which you often see people switch to with a miss like that. You know there's a chance for three if you leave Teresa the open hit. And this is truly one of those situations where it so could be actually, setting up for the three. I said, uh, said Teresa playing the drop. She actually probably recognized that Jill would guard that and is playing the hit and roll in behind. Needs the roll. So not quite enough. I think we'll see Jill go for the double. Just has to hit it on the center line side. Not really any risk. You're giving up two if you hit one of them, so may as well go for the double. You just don't want to miss everything altogether. I think that's probably a given. <laughs> Try sure. not to miss two in a row. And it's one of those things, pretty much the, the little things have been what have made the big difference in this game. Yeah, with a five-point lead, you really you just... You know, you can give up to. I thought Teresa might play that draw, but uh, didn't want a chance Jill guarding the shot stone. Drama over on our tiebreaker number one on sheet B. Hey, it looks like there's a few pretty close ones there. So there may be a... Th what appears to be potentially a three-way measure over there. So we'll let you know once it's, we hear. It's for a single point. Uh, Chad Stevens had hammer, but he's down three. So Jill with her second of two here. Just gets to the nose. So, but that, it, yeah, it does appear that it is pretty close for shot. Either way, it's going to be a nose hit probably for yeah, if, if you're in any way not sure of which stone is shot, and Teresa's just taking a second look, Marley thinks it's blue, uh, would like to call the draw. When you play the up weight and the hit, you have that chance of rolling out. Uh, it really goes to personal preference. Teresa tends, I would, <laughs> tends to prefer the hit game a little bit. Jill does as well. And that's the style that both of them have generally played with the past many years yeah, uh, fairly both of them clean. coming out playing uh, the third position where you generally have a lot more of that hit style play exactly so here we go final stone for Teresa Breen with the hammer looking for her deuce to get on the scoreboard
So it just needs to come up to nose on this one. They're waiting for the curl. Teresa's waiting as well. It doesn't sound happy as this one rolls and that will roll out and that will be the single. So a uh, little, well, I don't want to say a little, probably a big disappointment there. Down five, chance for two and uh, to only get the single is, is discouraging there in the seventh. So Breen will trail five to one. Brothers will have Hammer back uh, again for the first time since the second end, up four points. And uh, we did see the men on the Thompson-Stevens sheet, and it looked like it was one, a steal of one for Team Stuart Thompson. So they'll take a seven to three lead. It was a, a three-way measure. Uh, there were two blues, two Thompson blues, and one Stevens yellow. Chad did not have an easy shot. He had a double to squirt through. Uh, very complicated end as it turned out um, and just was on the wrong side of the measure for that one so he'll trail seven to three with hammer and eight and we will keep you updated as we go yes chad the former provincial runner-up just a few years ago and Stuart thompson runner-up la last year so if i remember correctly so you do remember correctly they, uh, so the battle of the former provincial runners up and they both to lost to Murphy, who was in the final. Yeah. So <laughs> they got to get past a couple other teams first, though. It'll be a big day for, for whichever team takes this one. Moving on, Daniel Thompson in the second tiebreaker, and Mark Dacey, uh, sorry, that's at 2 o'clock, and then Mark Dacey in the semifinal at 7. In the women's semifinal, winner of our game, our feature sheet here, Breed and Brothers will go on to play Kristen McDermott at 7 o'clock as well. So you can catch that all on Bell 5 TV 1. We've had streaming for you all week and are so pleased to uh, bring you continued coverage of the playoffs here. And it's been some great action for our viewers here all week. They bring in the action with you, to you for, I, think so. I believe this is now the about third year that we've ha had streaming on as a the first ever event that we had on stream with Bell 5 TV 1 was the 2015 Scotty's Tournament of Hearts here at the Dartmouth Curling Club. Yeah, so it, I suppose this is the, f uh, the fourth year then, isn't it? A couple years at Mayflower. Oh, yeah, and, uh, it, it, it would be four, Sco four now. Scotties now. Yeah, so the, <laughs> so yeah really be pleased to have there. Bell 5 TV 1 on board with us and uh, give credit. Uh, we only have the one stream on today, and our friend Sean Seneschal's down there, uh, his partner Chuck. I don't know Chuck's last name, so uh, Chuck sorry, Calder Chuck from Calder. Yes, thank you. Our five <laughs> TV one crew from Forty Five North. They've been fantastic great job. all week. Uh, Chuck's probably not listening right now. <laughs> He's probably sleeping. But thank you guys. Probably taking advantage so of it that the the early start and having uh, only one stream in operation to be able to definitely relax for the later oh, portions was, of this. I was this. talking to them last night. I think Chuck had already left and saying to Sean, "Well, we've got one stream." tomorrow and they said well that'll be me <laughs> so they're uh, they're in it to win it they've been doing a great job and all we have to do is make sure that they know the score right <laughs> yeah and and they do a really good job bringing the coverage of Nova Scotian curling to you the viewer TV ones that we thank producer Sean, Sean behind the scenes and the entire Bell 5 TV one crew our very dedicated crew of commentators working all week uh, up here bring, bringing you the insights from some of the province's finest. Yeah, thanks for that, John. We've had a fabulous group, some curling novices, some very experienced curlers, and hopefully for the viewers it's been fun. We've got a bit more to come with finals coming up. So Jen Brine puts the first rock in the rings, uh, and then we, uh, or sorry, we see the center guard, I'm thinking uh, Team does not have hammer. Team Breen puts up the, the guard, then the uh, the draw in the rings from Team Brothers. The second guard, unfortunately for Amanda, they're uh, very peelable. They're lined up to both go. They just are uh, she needed a little bit of separation. Teresa's call rings. I'd be also tempted to, to play another guard because I see those two blue center guards leaving, but uh, Jocelyn's going to put this one in. So Jocelyn Adams here from Team Breen looking to draw in behind cover. 
Got a steal here if you're Team Breen. Um, we're in the eighth. This is the last, or starting the last three ends. This one looks like uh, it's going to get buried. Really good opportunity to get rid of those uh, those guards. That's right. So, you know, if everything stays as it is and we keep seeing guard, peel, guard, peel, that'll be the counter at the end of the day. We would love to see that maybe a foot higher blocking the button versus on the button, but I, uh, I, don't, I think Jocelyn will take that at this point. And this one... Sarah Murphy maybe just tracked a little bit. Didn't get the double peel. So game on for the steal. So now that does give the opportunity for Teresa Breen to call for an another center guard. Try to protect the stone that they have at the button. Weaver's liking the weight here. From Jocelyn Adams, just looking to get it over as far as they can toward the center line to protect the stone there at the top of the button. Yeah, I think they would have liked to leave that maybe a little bit. Uh, would have yeah, they were originally calling 1-2, uh, which is a relatively higher guard. It, uh, that one being closer more to a what be called a three, which a some of our viewers may not be as familiar with a a lot of the teams will a divide the sheet into zones of a, a from one to twelve. It was popularized by the legendary Randy Furby from the Alberta and his Furby Four. As we see, interesting peel there is now it's team Teresa Green sitting 1-2 the guard spilling into the house and now it gives the opportunity for Teresa to, to place a guard again to protect the stones that she has locked in there So just protecting that situation. I think you guard the uh, the higher stone, which is why they're trying to get this to cross center, even if it means bringing it into the rings. If you didn't want that one in. So they just got it to the to bite the center line. Sitting one, two. Look, feel they need to get a few points back here to get this game back into a more manageable position. But Aaron Carmody looking to shut the game down a little bit. Goes a little, a little bit wide just enough still to make the takeout. Removes it to sit. Still uh, with Teresa Breen one and two. For Team Breen, a little bit of hope there sitting the two. At Unlikely chance, the fact that they're not lined up and they can't guard both at the same time. Unlikely chance that uh, they will get the steal of two. I think if they keep putting the center guard up, Jill can actually um, hit the back one or even come off her own to uh, to get the back one. Jill be okay with the steal of one here in the eighth, uh, still being up three. Hammer. This one, they have to try and get it to center. It's going to leave the shot stone exposed. Uh, and that is the higher stone as well. So the double's there, isn't it, John? Yes, it definitely is there. There's the position that as long as they can get, pretty much get need to get to the nose, even half of that is enough to get the double. And yeah, sit I think there too. The thing I think, it, the double seems like the natural call and it means you roll your shooter over. And I think then you see. Team Breen really needs to steal, so he might just come around that guard. Um, I'd be tempted to hit and just leave the shooter right there. You don't need to 
The double even flop underneath it. It's really going to make it hard for Breen to steal if you do that. So now, second of two from Aaron Carmody. Looking for the hit. Gets the double, rolls out the back. So here you see, I, I don't think it'll take long for Teresa to call this draw. She doesn't have many other options, but she has a guard and uh, a chance to sit one buried. So now on to skip stones from Teresa Breen, the former finalist in this event, looking to keep her Scotty's hopes alive. Still in tough, down by four with Outlast Rock. Just looking to draw here. Definitely. Super's calling a seven, that would be T-Line. They also appear to be saying that the line was a bit tight, so they're gonna need to go here to try to get by the guard. Once it gets by the guard, I think they'll see the sweeper switch. Oh, they're not even able to, because it's light. Just a little bit more of the struggle there. Breen, they've, uh, Teresa's been throwing mostly hits on her shots. Hasn't thrown a ton of draws. Um, so Jill's just gonna make this guard go away. Doesn't need to run it into the one in the top 12. Uh, I think there's a risk of a jam if she does that, but it would be over on the side, so not the end. But basically all Jill wants right now is to have a shot on her last, and she doesn't have that when there's uh, a guard out front necessarily. So Jill just talking to her front end, Murphy and Brian. Just being absolutely sure what results that she wants on this shot. And that's what's cool about curling. There's so many different things, but you know, every shot is a team shot. It's not a play that involves only one or two players. It's four, all four, all the time. Pretty wide here, but does nudge the guard to get it out of play. So it does appear like Teresa's, I think that she was calling for the, the draw around, but. Yeah, the, the hit kind of. The hit uh, also is you, tempting. You can't up two. So if you drew and left Jill some sort of double, uh, I think, yeah, even in the eighth, you give up one, you're down six. Uh, or, sorry, you're down five. Some magic can happen. You get a three, you steal two. Uh, I think that's the reason for this hit. It achieves a similar, if you make the roll, it achieves a similar result as the draw, and there's one less yellow stone in the rings. But it really is hard to play this defensive uh, hit call when you do need to steal. The final stone here for Teresa Breen without last rock. Gets the hit. Rolls over to the back of the forefoot, sits 1-2. So that's uh, just about as good as she could have done there. Maybe a little bit less roll if I want to be super critical, but I don't because that was a good shot. Yeah, it's definitely a good result there for Teresa Breen. She needs some of those good shots it, and benefit a little bit from her experience in this sport to keep her hopes alive here with three ends to play. Exactly, and Jill Brothers, uh, she's not gonna mess around. She's not gonna try and hit that shot stone or play anything to, to chance giving up a steal of two. She's gonna hit the top, try and get the double. If she scores one, great. If not, that's okay. Yeah, it's one of those situations where uh, even up this much, if you give up a steal of one, it's still fine because then you're still up by three with hammer. Yeah, so you make it 
make sure that one of those goes away. You don't want to uh, go for the back one and chance wicking the top and not removing either. You just hit the top one. If you get the double, perfect. So last shot, eight then, Jill Brothers. Up four. Final stone here. Brothers looking for the double. Calling them on. Will drive it by. Steal of one for Teresa Breen in end number eight. Still trails five to two, playing end number nine. It's going to be a challenge there, but Selena, it, it's certainly the, it, not out of the realm of possibility. No, it's it's not. A couple ends, you got to steal every end. It's a you need a two and a one, and uh, just as we're waiting to get started here in the ninth, we have another measure on sheet B. I don't know if there was a single point scored. Uh, I did. There was one for sure. Steal. Uh, for Team Stuart Thompson with a nice freeze uh, and obviously a miss on Chad Stevens last. So a steal of one and they're measuring. It's another three-way measure. This time it's two Stevens stones, one Thompson stone. But again, we have uh, at least an eight, uh, eight to three score in favor of Team Stuart Thompson. Yeah, maybe one of those situations where that game could start to get out, out of the hands of the former Deloitte Tankard runner-up. Which one? <laughs> well, sorry. <laughs> a, a few years ago, ha having a heartbreaker of a finish yes. there. Well, I was just referring to Stuart yeah. also. Both, so. both are, are runners, <laughs> former runners-up in this event. I, and I think it was a, a, the indication a from the official was a, a steal of two. Uh, so we'll look at the score here. That's going to be a 9-3 a after seven ends. Stevens with hammer. He'll be down six points. So uh, starting to look similar on these sheets, isn't it? That's, uh, they're a little further behind. They're only starting the eighth now, so they're an end behind. Those teams always, uh, they run their clocks pretty close. So Team Brothers uh, bring this one here to the back of the 12 foot. So again, Team Breen, we saw it last end. They need those center guards. So Amanda will be asked to put the second one up. Play with her a bit of a miss in the last end on those center guards from a missed peel. And that's what started everything. I say a missed peel. It's one peel was made, but the double peel wasn't made. So Amanda again going for that center guard. Needs it to curl a little bit here early. <coughs> Get a center line. Just enough for the double guard. So same as in the last end, Team Brothers with Hammer up several. They're only up three, not four this time. But Jen Bryan uh, puts her first one in, nice position. I call that the insurance rock at the back of the rings. If all else fails uh, and you hit everything else out, you may be able to score with that rock. Uh, throws her second one through. They Again, defensive team, and they do not need to score to win. So with two ends to go, keeping things clean is the name of the game for Team Brothers. So now you're going to see Teresa Breen calling for her second Jocelyn Adams to come around the two guards that she has in play at just above the house on the center line. Appeared to be the top four. Yeah, a great position for this stone from Jocelyn. It's, it's funny, we always talk about leads making those come arounds. Uh, but really, when you do need to steal and you have the two center guards, it's the second stone, the, the second stone's uh, first rock that is that critical draw for that steal point. Uh, so they're waiting for the line here. It's starting to move nicely now. Now they can go for weight. They'd love this to be just biting the top four. And they're getting it a little deeper, full four. So really nice shot there from Jocelyn Adams when it's desperately needed from her team. So that does... 
the need for a, a double peel on those guards now that the free guard zone is out of play following the four rocks. It's funny, uh, this is the natural way to, to play across the face and lose your shooter. The only risk is jamming on your back stone. I don't think that's going to be a counter at the end of the day, but a bit of a mental uh, issue if you do get that jam. So Sarah Murphy, second, second stones here. Looking for the double peel. And are we going to get that jam over the top? So from Sarah Murphy, former junior skip uh, representing Nova Scotia at Junior Nationals yep. in 2006, uh, 2006, where she came third. And uh, now plays second stones for this brother's rink. A lot, uh, a lot of the former junior skips move up and get experience in the women's and the men's level, playing for uh, more experienced skips at that level. Yeah, you've seen a lot of that with, with recent uh, moves up to, uh, in the women's circuit. Uh, probably the most po most significant one being Jocelyn Peterman moving exactly. up to play with Chelsea Carey. National junior champion, but uh, guess what? You get to play with uh, with that team. I think you say yes. We saw that. Uh, I know just uh, my own personal. <laughs> sees my brother Stuart on the other uh, sheet. There was a, a skip in the junior ranks, winning a couple junior provincials, and then played for Mark Dacey at third stones for a couple years before uh, going to skip. And then his third, Colton Steele, former junior skip as well, actually coming runner up to Stuart. And they said, "Well, we're we're both young guys. Why don't we team up and make a good." Uh, team that has a multi-year plan and that's uh so those are two skips at the back end and if i'm not incorrect i think travis coulter the second on that team has skipped before as well i believe he has it, it uh, he, Looking at he his did dad. play it, it travis did play it travis for a long time with a with, uh, golden steel yeah and this year they were joined at Leadstones by Taylor Ardeal, the one of the ice makers here at th this Dartmouth Curling Club. I was told by Taylor at one point that probably his family out in Alberta would be probably tuning in. I'm so points. sorry, Lynn. <laughs> Lynn. Lynn will watch all of the games she'll be watching this stream to get a peek of her son over on the other sheet so lynn our deals watching <laughs> she does reach out uh and lets us know that she is watching <laughs> and i usually say hi a couple times <laughs> <laughs> and hi to everyone who's watching from home here on bell 5 tv1 we'd love to have you out of the dartmouth curling club but if you can't make it uh I think this is a pretty good way to watch the games. Yeah, it's def definitely some great curling action uh, and some great value to watch some great curling here at the Dartmouth Curling Club. Still two draws to play here on Saturday as we'll have tiebreaker number two in the men's side at 2 o'clock before both semifinals at 7. So there's two yellow stones in the rings. We're down to third stones here. Um, for Team Breen, not a lot of great places to hide. You guard your shot stone and there's a short raise. I don't think Joe will play that necessarily. You, she might still peel the guard. Um, for Team Breen, make something uh, something good here. Maybe sit two at some point and, and make Jill have a hard shot. But at third stones, I think you continue guarding just like they're doing. Teresa again uh, running out to help out her team needs to get it over as far as they can. Has to get it over the line first and uh, whew, they just do it. Yeah, just enough to get it over the hog line. Still sits shot stone, but, right, but that stone is completely open. So Marley splits um, the shot stone is accessible, but that center guard I think is what's going to hurt Team Brothers, so they'll call a timeout. timeout called. The rays on their own yellow isn't there, um, but I mean, you just got to keep looking at it. They're up, even if they give up a steal of one, they're still up two with Hammer coming home. Um, 
so give yourself a shot on your last. That guard, the Breen team played it for a reason. If you hit shot stone, I think Team Breen's just going to make it even better, and you won't have anything. They'll make that draw even better. So we'll have fifth Bliss. Uh, I almost called her Bliss Comstock. That used to be her yeah, name. Bl Bliss, Bliss Joyce. Joyce comes out here to their team. Let's try to listen in to see if we can hear. All right, keep Just it simple. Keep They're it talking. Simple. They peel the guard that the other team may put up another guard. Then you'll have a draw to the four foot, the full four for a single point. Um, if things keep going this way, we still are on the sec the last of third stones here with Aaron Carmody throwing. I totally agree that the peel is a great call here uh, for the reasons I mentioned. If you give Teresa a chance to make that stone even better, that will hurt you more than, uh, than keeping it clean. So Team Breen will be forced to be the, the creative shot makers with Team Brothers making this peel. I think we'll see the guards still. Teresa will wait for her last to make a, a more uh, creative move. I, I guess I'll call whatever the shot she chooses is, which I think may be a draw to sit to. Yeah, that probably will be the result once we get through these next few stones. We sure like to take the fun out of it, don't we, John? It's uh, oh, in two shots time, though. This will be the call. and <laughs> No surprises. This is what every curler does. You try and, and think two, three, four, five, even six shots ahead. You're always planning for the end of the end, even when you're calling your first stones. And that's what you need to do because, again, curling being a very me mental game sometimes, you have to be able to be prepared and have that game plan going. As we see this first stone here from Teresa Breen, looking to, appears to play, be playing the guard, but a little bit heavier than seen from the guards earlier in the end. Certainly is. So this one's uh, going to have Jocelyn on it to try and get the curl. We didn't talk about directional sweeping today, but uh, you might be tired of hearing us like a broken record about it. Uh, the, the outside sweeper that is pushing in the direction of the curl will be the one that to the rock to try and get maximum curl out of it. But with these moratorium broom heads, uh, people are finding it harder and harder to carve a rock. Yeah, it does make it a bit of a challenge. It, a, and it's a style sweeping that we've a, only started to really see the past few years, and it pretty much took the entire world by storm. Yep, that was the Gushu year. They figured it out first and yeah. certainly capitalized Pre on it. Yeah, pretty much once uh, Brad Gushu and Mike McEwen both started y using yeah. that style of sweeping, that really caused... A little bit of controversy, and it, it caused some changes in, in how, how the equipment regulations in curling are dealt with. I think it's a positive move for the sport. I mean, you look at it, all other sports, whether it's uh, something played, you know, we had issues with the inflation of footballs and things like that. So it really is like a, a regulation to try and keep everything on fair playing ground and, and with curling. Um, it brings back the finesse of the game and, and takes a little bit of the, uh, <laughs> one of the terms used was joysticking, takes the joysticking out of it. With that stone coming deep for Teresa, Jill has a chance to hit here. Uh, I think they were just looking at how they make this. So there's two different ways to, to look at it. This team, there's some separation between the two stones. Um, so they're talking drag versus angles. Uh, the drag, if, if you hit the top stone and the, the back one's close enough, it'll actually go in the direction that you would have hit the top stone in. But they're going on the angles here and hoping to redirect this yellow back onto the blue. First two here. And she'll do just that. The raised stone will roll to the back edge of the rings there, but that yellow that Jen Bryan threw on her first, that's the, the shot stone right now interestingly enough. So Teresa has a draw here. She's going to take this as far back as possible while still remaining in the forefoot trying to get uh, shot stone. 
and make any shot for Jill difficult. So the steal of two doesn't look to be in play here, I would say. It does appear here that Jill Brothers is sitting shot stone, but it does appear that the second shot does belong to Teresa Breen. So she doesn't have last stone, but she's down three points. Teresa Breen trying to sit one and hopefully steal another point. Final stone without last rock here. Sweeper saying, being asked to sweep for seven, which is pretty much the top four to the button. Jocelyn had a really good stone here. Uh, this one looks like it might be up in weight. The line's gonna be okay but uh, might not stop in the forefoot. Pull the back 12, still is shot, and makes uh, a run back difficult, but Jill will have the draw. And the nice thing for Jill Brothers here is she is second stone. So again, risk reward, maximum you give up is a single. You don't play any kind of crazy shot, just go for the single, uh, the draw. And with Teresa's coming a bit deep there, she only has to achieve full eight foot for the single. Yeah, keeping with that strategy that they, their fifth bliss choice kept reminding them during the timeout of just keep it simple. Looking to draw to take her single point here in end for nine. Just going through her routine. Final stone here in end nine. Jill Brothers, the former champion in this event with the hammer. Super saying it's heavy, but uh, it will start to curl as the speed comes off. They just need it to, uh, to rub that back blue stone. And is this one gonna move by? Oh my goodness, and I think it will be a steal of one for Teresa Breen, so uh, the dream stays alive. We're going into 10. They're down two, but they've stolen two consecutive points. Can they uh, put something together and steal two in the 10th end? We shall see. Team Brothers up two will have hammer. Yeah, it's one of those things that our viewers have seen a lot during this a both during this event and during the junior championship where teams have been able to get a lot of steals out of nowhere, it sometimes has appeared. And they have caused some pretty big comebacks when they've needed it. Exactly, so uh, here on Bell 5 TV1, the, we're keeping going. We're into 10. These are long games. Luckily for, uh, for the team, this challenge, they have a bit of a break. They, uh, the semifinals at seven o'clock. It's a little different on the men's side. Winner has to play at two o'clock versus Kendall Thompson. And again, uh, we mentioned earlier, Team Stuart Thompson with a, a commanding lead there, nine to three. They're playing nine, so we'll have to see what happened in the eighth. It looked like Chad Stevens scored, so uh, scored a single. So it's nine to four over there. Thank you to all of the fans that are here at the Curly Club keeping me updated. Hey, uh, so that does appear, as long as it goes the way that it appears to go, it will, may be a battle of the brothers in tiebreaker number two hey, as Tom Thompson up nine four with Last Rock. We'll keep you updated as we see results coming out of that sheet. So now we're seeing a little bit of a different style compared to what what we probably have seen with it being this stone from Jen Bryan. Okay, it went a bit further than we had, had seen. It, they tried to get it behind, it behind where they were and now went through the house. Opportunity for Amanda Simpson to come around hers, it appears. 
Well, if things go like they did in the last end, it, that would be a steal too. Uh, without shot stone, not saying that that's going to repeat. I don't think I've ever seen an exact curling end repeat with the exception of maybe some blanks, but uh. Okay, so this pier now they are going for the guard here. Calling the sweepers <laughs> off here. Amanda, I don't know if you saw that on the camera there uh, or heard it in the, the microphone. What are we doing? So uh, if it's light, you leave it light. If it's heavy, you can drag it into the rings. Jen's going to try and put this, uh, what I always will dub, an insurance rock at the back of the rings now. It's okay she threw her first one through. If she had put this one, put it there on her first, she would be throwing it through on her second. So just uh, it's doing it in a different order this time. Yeah, pretty much gets the opportunity for her to try to repeat the shot that she's been trying for. Does get it to the T-line just behind now sitting in the eight foot so that's a good shot again team brothers they were leading five nothing and after giving up a single and two consecutive uh, single steals they're only up five to three they do have hammer but uh, it's got to weigh on your mind a little bit when you say yeah mentally uh, when you have those steals coming back at at you it puts you under a lot of pressure to be able to make the sh big shots to close out the game of course, uh, these teams will, the, whoever does end up winning this match will want to have to take the time to be able to rest and regroup before a, an exciting match this evening against Kristen McDermott. Certainly will be. McDermott was uh, playing very well all week. They were undefeated and uh, then suffered a couple losses. Just, uh, I think it was their last two games actually. So they'll be looking to come back with a good win tonight to make the final and take on Marianne Arsenault. And I... Yeah, it was actually a, lo a, a loss, I believe, to the Jill Brothers here, which... It was, yeah. Uh, which actually knocked her out of a potentially getting the bye to the final. Because exactly. Marianne Arsenault had uh, only lost to Kristen McDermott, so if McDermott had, had stayed at one loss, uh, she would have gotten the bye based on head-to-head -to, -head to the final. So it was a big game for Brothers to stay in it and for McDermott to keep the one spot, but it, it did go to Brothers. And I watched that game. Uh, it was a steal of one, or sorry, a... Uh, Brothers was up, and uh, McDermott had a shot for two. She had an easy shot for one and a tough shot for two, went for the two, and unfortunately wrecked on a guard. So didn't get the single to tie it, uh, and that's where Arsenal then defeated uh, Colleen Pinkney to stay at the single loss and go straight through to the final. And it was one of those exciting uh, Friday night finales because into the final draw we actually had, I believe, four teams with the potential to make it into a tiebreaker position. Yes, we did. So now... If Colleen I'll, Pinckney had won against Arsenault... That would have caused a whole bunch of tiebreaker yeah. insanity for us here on a, a Saturday. Unfortunately, Colleen had, had a challenging weekend of finishing 2-5. and five. As we see this stone here from Sarah Murphy. Oh, yeah, that was Colleen Jones, I think. Colleen Pinkney oh. was two oh, and four. Action three and four. Apologies about that there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Colleen Jones was three and four also. Not a bad week for, uh, for their team, their team competing in the seniors. A different lineup th this week as a uh, Colleen Jones played, I believe, second, second or third. third yeah. yeah, she played third uh, as. Oh, second. It, I'm oh, a she liar. played second. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> it, uh, that uh, as uh, her team would have had to make a little bit of a change as Colleen will be going to broadcast at the Olympic Games. So we see this stone here from Team Breen setting up another guard to protect their stone at 
the side of the button. And again, they'll uh, Team Breen, they are down two. So they'll have to come up uh, with, like I say, some more interesting shots as we get further down in the end. We're on to third stones. Carmody with the peel. Gets the hit, rolls out the side. She's made a lot of those <laughs> today. I think she's only missed. I don't even know if she's missed any. Jill missed a peel, but I don't know if Aaron has. Uh, I don't believe Aaron has, and that's been the type of style that, that she's been extremely effective at he, in the past few years when we've seen her while playing yeah, here. she joined the it, team this year, and she threw four stones for Kathy O'Rourke. Runner is up in 2010 at the Scotties. Uh, so obviously a very confident thrower with a nice experience winning at the junior ranks. Moving from PEI to Nova Scotia. Another guard put up here from Teresa Breen's team. So that will probably lead to another peel attempt from Aaron Carmody. NEC Team Brothers, they're calling this these peels on uh, a specific side of center as to avoid any jam possibility on the back yellow stone that Brothers has in the rings. So all her peels made, I think we can safely say for Aaron Carmody. Now on to skip stones here in and number 10, Teresa Breen looking for a steal of two to try to extend this game one more end. Looking, it appears to try to a pretty similar guard to what her team has been throwing so far. Exactly. Again, we'll wait for her last to make the move to sit two and hope for uh, hope for a miss. Is that back one on, John? I, I think it might be. I, so she could sit three potentially. I, I don't know. It does appear like it would be. Would there we be. can. Uh, I can see it on a different camera angle that we have here at the club. Uh, it's just nibbling the back 12 foot. So Teresa could hit that open yellow and sit three, hope for a rollout, and uh, that would be game on. But for now, Jill will make her last shot as easy as possible by clearing this front guard. So we'll see this first of two from Jill Brothers, the former Canadian junior champion and former Scotty's Turn of Hearts Provincial winner here in Nova Scotia. Looking to peel out the guard. Looks like it's curling over pretty early here, but we'll get the, the peel roll out. All right, so she going for the hit here? Yeah, I think so. Up here she is there, so going for the hit, her three. Again, pretty much putting the, the brush almost where she wants to hit the rock. So, really, probably playing some weight at, at it a little, little bit to try to hold the, the line there. And final stone over there on it. sheet B. Stuart Thompson drew for his single point, and it will be a 10-4 victory for Team Thompson over Chad Stevens. Stevens' tournament is over, and it will be a battle of the brothers in tiebreaker number two as Stuart Thompson will face Kendall Thompson. Winner to go on to the semifinals against Mark Dacey at 7 o'clock. Final stone for... Green without last rock, looking for the hit. This is to sit three. They will need a miss. They'll need a roll out from Jill. And this uh, this has to stick around. And we'll get to 
the nose here. So it will be a hit and stick for the single point and the victory. There you can see uh, that back blue stone is in the ring. So Breen sits three. They did just about all they could this end. Uh, down two points without. If you sit three and you get a miss, you can tie things up. Uh, so Jill Brothers here, big shot. Needs to stick around so and make the semifinal. It's a dramatic result here from, from this women's tiebreaker. Coming down right here to the last rock. Everybody on the edge of their seats for this one. Final stone with the hammer in end number 10. Brothers calling them on here. It's curling a lot. It's coming a lot across center. Powers sweeping it. There and with it. the jam. And it will be a steal of two, and we're going to extra ends out of nowhere. That is incredible. That was not something that we expected, but what a comeback from the, this Teresa Breen forced him to come back from 5 nil down to send us off to extra ends. So we're going to take a short 5 TV1. Uh, come back in a few minutes. We will have an extra end here in this dramatic tiebreaker with a steal of two from Team Breen. Brothers will have Hammer. Catch you back in a few.
And ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to continuing coverage of this women's tiebreaker action here on a Saturday morning here at the Dartmouth Curling Club. I'm John Seitman, Selena Thompson alongside a shocker here as Jill Brothers rolled just far enough to force a steal of two for Teresa Breen hanging on the edge in, in this one. A, but again, she's come back from a 5-0 deficit to tie this game. That was, uh, I haven't seen so many shots, too many shots as dramatic as that. And I would have bet money that Jill wouldn't have uh, missed a, an open hit. But welcome to curling, folks. Again, sometimes that happens in, in this sport. Even the shots that you think are, are the simplest of results can be the hardest shots to miss when the times or make when the times get tough well our story hasn't changed brothers with hammer needs to score here uh, but whoever scores will win this game and Jen Bryan just going a bit deep there it stays in the back of the house uh, team brothers again they're going to want to keep this clean Jill's just going to need a shot on her last to score the single but uh, I think we'll see a second uh, center go up from Team Breen here. Nice tight guard on Amanda Simpson's first. They're calling a one, which would be a high guard. You get as much separation as possible. And Amanda's had her guards be a little close together in the past couple ends, but uh, got away with it. Now they're just sweeping uh, to get the extra bit of curl and line them up a bit, guarding the button. So here getting the second guard. Different strategy from Team Brothers. They were, uh, when they were up in points, they were going for the draw to the wings, but uh, Jen being asked to make this. This is critical for Team Brothers. Yeah, Jen trying to come around those guards here. This needs to be in the top of the rings, not curling. It makes me think it might be a little heavy does appear to be a little bit heavier than they had expected. It is starting to curl now, though. And that will stop just in time to be in the top of the rings. And uh, then we'll start to see the coming from Team Brothers once again. But now we'll see Jocelyn Adams, the second for Team Breen. I, it does appear like she's going to be called to come to that stone top of the forefoot. Yes, for Team Breen, just put this in a good position. Again, I think this one is, uh, we're not seeing the curl super early. They're calling seven, which is T-line. Pass to curl to get to nose. Really want to tap that, but the line looks good. Little tap's okay there. Pushes the Yellowstone to back button. So a good shot for on her first from Jocelyn Adams. A note for our, our viewers there. Uh, the rules now in this extra end, four and a half minutes of thinking time each. I believe that each of the teams will have a timeout available yes. if yeah. they so require. So going for the du double peel. And Sarah Murphy has been solid on this, the peels all game, but nuts the the, uh, the double peel. They're still shot, but uh, with two center guards out front, Team Breen has the chance to put another good stone in the rings here. So now Teresa Breen will call on Jocelyn Adams to play the pretty much the draw to the, the button, try to freeze it onto the stone at the back of the four foot. Yeah, exactly. Sweeper's just talking with Jocelyn about the path. They haven't thrown, um, they're saying they haven't thrown this path as much. More of the intern has been the choice. And that generally has been the style of this sheet with playing more, most of the intern side in some of the games that I've seen on this. Sweeper's working on this one though too. It looks like it's gonna need to go. Maybe the ice is a little fresh still. 
Are they on the Oh, and it'll just wick. That's okay. It's another rock out front. Brothers is not going to ignore those. Uh, you might see these two blues gone, and hopefully the throne stone can roll up and out the side. And that does appear like that will be the call. Brothers. Some people may say, oh, you're sitting one. Why don't you just guard? Uh, no, you have to have a shot. You have to open things up and have something on your last. If Breen were, uh, if you were to guard and Breen were to <laughs> ever get shot, you're shooting yourself in the foot with that. So Sarah Murphy will go for the, the peel again. Another double peel attempt. This one's quite thin. Looks really good. We'll get both stones out of play. Opens up that path. So Teresa's going to call on Jocelyn to go for the guard again. Or is this now up to Marley? I think. Yeah, it is. It's pretty much. Yeah, it is. Mar Marley. Now, so on to made stones. Trying to guard up the front. Hanging on the edge here, looking to try to score a steal once again. I'm sure Kristen McDermott's team uh, may be wa potentially watching with anticipation trying to figure out the, their plan for wh whoever advances out of this semi-final. Yeah, the I, I, is a tiebreaker. I think they probably uh, <laughs> they were playing and hopefully they didn't turn the, the feed off. We got extra end action on Bell 5 TV1. This is a very tense game. And it's been pretty much a tale of two halves because it, it, ever since that seventh bend, it's been a, a few little shocking misses that, it, that have been the difference which have gotten Teresa Breen back in this game. As we see a jam on the, the front now. A few options here for Teresa Breen as it appears timeout has been called so we'll have uh, I think Jeff uh, is yeah, around Je Jeff Wilson, uh, yeah I just Coach saw Jeff Wilson Breen. and and the alternate for team brothers Bliss Joyce will make their way to ice level So for Team Breen, um, I think they know how to steal. They have done it in three consecutive ends. They're not shot. So they'll have to figure out in which order they're going to play the next few shots. Three stones remaining for each team. So do you make the move now knowing that Team Brothers uh, have the chance to hit into the rings? I think Team Brothers will continue to peel if you put up a guard, uh, but they'll just consult with Jeff on what the, what, how they'd like this end to shape up because they really will be dictating the play. What do you think, John? I, I personally, I'll tell you what I think first, I guess. <laughs> I personally think it, you're still a little too early to, to make the play for Shot Stone. It's just such a 
a juicy little situation for later to play a tap up to that button. That stone in the back button is helping Breen so much right now. Yeah, I would tend to agree there simply in the fact that that you ha have the ability to protect that stone to prepare it for later in, in the end when you're probably going to need it a little bit more. It does appear though like they are are they going for the the guard or are they going for that that freeze? I think this that, is a, the freeze. come around. The, the freeze, freeze on freeze. the other side. We did have we saw really good curl on Jocelyn's. Um, I I would still be tempted to play the, the guard on the other side. Um, by the team, the, there's no wrong decision when you're looking at these kinds of options. It's what your team is comfortable with. Uh, Marley might have wanted to throw this too. This is uh, another. Um, and having two blue stones in the rings is not bad. So if you're saying eight, that would be back four foot. So it's going to need to come down here. So once it gets past this guard, it's going to move. Question is, where does it land? Very heavy, where does it stop? Well, it'll, it'll freeze that back stone, but definitely not what this team wanted. We did see that nice finish as it started to come in the rings, but an extra six feet of weight uh, and it just skims by. Well, do you take this opportunity to lose your back uh, four foot stone that's hurting you? Nose hit on the blue. I like this call. Yeah, it, it should be an interesting that, call. That yellow yeah. stone, we're having, we're having some conversations in the club up here too. I just think that yellow stone, the back button, hurts Team Brothers so much. It's backing for Team Breen if they just tried to, to play into it. Um, Jill, you always come back to she wants a stone, a shot on her last, and I think she'd like a shot at uh, the, the forefoot for a draw. We know Team Breen's gonna now going to be coming around that, uh, that yellow stone, but it won't be perfectly on the button. Final stone here from Aaron Carmody. Final stone of her. Stone's at third. Throwing a lot here. So didn't actually clip that back yellow. Rolled in behind the guard though. Team Breen will have two shots to make this delicate little freeze. Might have two shots. She at least has one yeah, right it, now. It, it, it does open it up now there that, that they, they were originally playing that inside which they haven't been playing as much this game it, now that that rolled over just enough it's enough that the intern is now available yeah that back stone is exposed the shooter rolling behind the guard actually really blocks off the draw path for Breen um, I think they were playing for clipping the back one trying to get a bit of a roll and still clipping the back one um, very tough to get that so the result is uh, there is a chance, there is an opening for Team Breen. Very different end for the previous ones as Team Brothers wasn't able to keep it as clean as they had. But a nice little shot from Aaron Carmody. Uh, but if Teresa can make this, Jill isn't going to have a lot. So on the skip stones here in the extra end, Teresa Breen, the veteran skip of this team out of the Mayflower Curling Club. Looking for the freeze at the button. Calling them on. It's getting close here. And she oh gets my gosh, shot out of this. They get shot out of that. It's close, but. I'm pretty sure. I don't know if the teams are, but. Uh, yeah, I'd be pretty sure looking at that. It does appear to me like it would be one to Teresa Breen. It is, uh, we're just looking down, we're, we're above the sheet here at the Dartmouth Curling Club, John and I, and uh, just looking down, it looks like it's edge to edge, and the fact that that didn't get that last tiny bit of finish, really good shot, it's really hard to do much better than that. But Teresa, it looks like Jill can hit a big chunk of the blue and uh, make it go flying, but she has to be so careful here to uh, not clip that front yellow. So the safe way would be to to hit the blue uh, on the wide side. Don't necessarily risk clipping the yellow and missing everything and letting Teresa guard. 
And it will be interesting to see this spot on the, the sheet because in some areas it has been gliding out just a slight little bit. So they're going to need to have a way to ensure that that blue gets moving. Here we go. I think uh, even half a stone will spring, but is this one tight? It looks slightly tight to me here. It's coming. Wow, it's what a shot. Hit. Great the front end. Jen Bryan, Sarah Murphy, they held that the whole way down, and uh, there was no air between Jill's thrown stone and that yellow. As you can see in the shot there, uh, she knows that uh, that blue counter. Two wonderful shots from the skips on their first. So Teresa's going to have to play a little tap here. Uh, she can tap this yellow stone back leave her shooter be shot and this will be it this is her for her steal point and she needs this one this is her scotty's journey on the line here so for teresa breen looking like there was uh Limited chance, but has made a wonderful comeback, and it and needs a. This is her last shot. Jill Brothers will have one, but Teresa looking to tap the Brothers Yellowstone to the back four foot, back eight foot, and leave the shooter in the top four. This one needs to curl. Yeah, sweepers working on it. They need it to curl as much as they can. It's coming over now. Question is how far. So enough to get shot, maybe a bit extra weight that pushed the Yellowstone to the back 12 foot and that would, uh, would have resulted in the lack of curl. Sits shot, but it is an, an open hit. I say an open hit once again for Jill Brothers to, to win the game because that's what she had uh, last end. So if she makes this, it will have just taken her an extra 15 minutes to get the win. Yeah, timeout was called just to be absolutely sure that she has all the time that she needs to make this shot down to about rough seconds on the clock. So here we go. Jill Brothers, the former Scotty's champion, looking for the hit and stick to book her spot in the semifinals against Kristen McDermott. Sweeper's just dusting this one. Brooms up, and there you go. It will be three points and the win. So in dramatic fashion, Jill, Jill Brothers, Brothers moves on. That'll be the semi against Kristen McDermott. That's at 7 o'clock, and we will have it live for you here the, yeah. at the Dartmouth Curling Club and on Bell 5 TV 1. Yeah, that will be on sheet D at 7 o'clock. And... So now the final situation there for tiebreakers. It will be Stuart Thompson versus Kendall Thompson in a battle of the brothers at two. And the winner will book themselves into the men's semifinal against Mark Dacey at 7 o'clock here on Sheet C. The Thompson versus Thompson tiebreaker will take place at 2 o'clock on Sheet D. A few final updates, a few final thoughts there just before we close off. Selena? What a dramatic game. I, I, <laughs> I hope they don't do that in the, the semifinal. Uh, I don't think. Yeah, it could make for a nerve wracking finish. <laughs> handle it. But. So, on behalf of our a Bell 5 TV1 crew from 45 North producer Sean Senechill and my broadcast colleague, Nina Thompson, thank you very much for tuning in to this. You are, are what? You've been watching the. Scotty's Tournament of Hearts here on Bell 5 TV 1, your leader in local sports webcasting. See you at 2 o'clock for Thompson versus Thompson. <laughs>